Hello and welcome to today's webinar on Project Panama, Seeing It in Action. We'll give attendees a couple minutes uh, before we get started. Hello again, and welcome to today's webinar uh, on Project Panama, Seeing It in Action. This is the second webinar in our three series webinar about Project Panama. Uh, my name is Jenny Hang, and I'll be your host today. Uh, before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items. Today's session is being recorded, um, so we'll be sending slides um, and the recording to you after the presentation. On your screen, you'll also see a Q&A chat window. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, ask them during the session and we'll answer them um, at the end. If for some reason we run out of time, we will uh, follow up directly with you. And last, um, we have a so short survey at the end of the webinar. Please kindly fill this out so we can continue to improve our webinars. Your feedback is really important to us. So today's session is being presented by Carl D, a Senior Developer Advocate at Azul Systems. He's our Java enthusiast and he loves sharing and advocating Java-based technologies. Before we get started, Carl wanted to ask a, a quick question to help tailor the question. So I'll go ahead and pull up that poll. So we're collecting responses now, and then um, I'll just give it a few seconds, and then let's go ahead and bring up the all right. So let me go ahead and share those results. It looks like we have 60% of you have uh, heard of it, um, but have not used it and 20% uh, have and have used it and then 20% have not heard of it. So thank you for that. Excellent. All right. Am I, am I good to go? Yeah. So Carl, let's uh, let's if you can kick us off. Awesome. Hey, everybody. Thank you for coming to this webinar on Project Panama, seeing it in action. This is the second of the three part webinar series. If you've missed the first webinar, Project Panama, what's it all about? Go to azul.com under the learn tab, click on webinars on demand or search for webinar. I'm really excited to talk to you about today about native memory access. The goal of this talk is to increase your skills when talking to native libraries. This happened last time. <laughs> okay, before we get started, I just want to tell you a little bit about Azul. Uh, at Azul, we build high performance Java runtimes that help customers reduce cloud infrastructure costs by lowering latency and increasing throughput. We have two JVMs to choose from. Both are derived from the OpenJDK and are TCK tested. 
We offer a community edition called Azul Platform Core or Zulu, a free version with the option of paid support and Platform Prime, which contains optimized features such as the C4 garbage collector, uh, the pauseless garbage collector, Falcon JIT compiler that replaces Hotspot, CNC or cloud native compiler, a distributed JIT compiler using cloud resources. And ready now, uh, the feature uh, for fast JVM startup scenarios. Uh, so just head over to azul.com slash downloads to download uh, the uh, JVMs so you can start uh, piloting them and testing them. Okay, let's get started. Here is today's agenda. Uh, the agenda is uh, we're going to recap on the last webinar about foreign function APIs. Uh, um, next is how to allocate memory with memory layouts and value layouts. And uh, we're going to talk about how to create and access primitives and C structs and array of structs. And um, here you get a chance to learn about Java's var handle API. This is how you traverse through uh, group layouts and, and structs and arrays of structs. And finally, a demo that will illustrate two versions of JavaFX, um, uh, a JavaFX analog clock. And so uh, one is using Java's zone date time class. That's how it accesses, it accesses the time and date um, from uh, that class. And the other one is using Project Panama's access to native C's um, time functions. So make sure you stay all the way to the end to see the demo. So if you would like to see the source code and the examples of the webinar series, just head over to my GitHub account, uh, github.com slash Carl D uh, Panama webinar, uh, capital P and then capital W there. Um, head over there and there's instructions uh, to go further uh, with another tool that I'm gonna talk about later about J extract. So, um, so let's start recapping um, about foreign function APIs from the first webinar. So if you remember from the first webinar, we talked about creating method handles. As you can see here, there are six steps to invoke a native function. First, you create a memory session, you obtain a linker, then um, you look up the symbols within the default uh, lookup area or the symbol lookup and it returns a symbol in memory, which is a memory segment instance. Um, then uh, step four is um, uh, the important function descriptor where you uh, use value layouts that are predefined in Project Panama that allows you to describe a native function signature, like such as the return type and, and the inbound arguments passed in. Then uh, using the linkers down call handle method, it returns you um, a method handle. And then step six is uh, how to invoke um, uh, the actual uh, native function. So as we mentioned before, a memory session is created via the try resource block. And of course, um, that's how this is very important uh, because this is the um, this is how you actually create things in memory. Um, I want to also mention this, um, but what about situations where you want to do further cleanup once a memory session is closed? Uh, to do so, you would use this add close action method on the memory session. I didn't mention this in the first or previous uh, webinar, but I thought it was worth mentioning because this can really come in handy um, in the future. So basically, I just want to mention this. It's uh, really nice. 
the order of operations is, you know, the first is your, you know, block of code, your native execution code. Then when you come out of scope of the try block, um, the, the memory um, is released or um, it closes and then it deallocates the memory uh, that's created within that scope. And then your function or Lambda that's passed into the add close action is actually called. So you can do additional cleanup work, but that happens at the end after um, the session is closed. So after creating a memory session, the code obtains the linker to look up the symbols. Um, in this case, uh, the C function printf uh, from standard io.h, the header. And then um, it calls the down call handle method to create the um, method handle. In this case, we're defining it using the function um, descriptor dot of method and the first argument is java underscore int which is a value layout those are the predefined value layouts that uh describe uh the the 60 or the 32-bit value that represents a integer um, is the interaction between the java world and c world where uh it lays out uh, the value or the the byte width. So um, there again, uh, the of void, which is the um, other method that implies that the return type is void. And the, the uh, first argument uh, would be yet another uh, memory layout or a value layout, which we'll talk about later. Everything describing things in memory or regions of memory is they all inherit from the parent class um, memory layout. Okay, enough about recapping from the first webinar. Let's uh, talk about allocating memory. So um, what is a memory layout? Before we allocate memory, we have to know how memory could be laid out. So let's look at um, two examples. This simplistic view, here's a, an example of, a, of clear text that can be seen you know, as an array of bytes in a region of memory with on the left an offset um, just describing where it is positionally and it's zero relative. So um, here you see the text uh, the ASCII representation in hexadecimal values, hello world, uh, project Panama in action. Uh, the first five uh, ASCII characters, the capital H is 48 hex, uh, lowercase e is 65, and then you have LL, which is 6C, and, and so on. So that's the representation of text in memory uh, laid out in that way. Um, so there's other representations. So here's another example. Um, you could have a region in memory just like it was in the previous slide where you had Project Panama in action, but in a region of memory, you could actually have longs or C longs or even you know Java longs where it's um, eight bytes. And here uh, there's two long values. Uh, the first one, um, it's zero uh, uh, and to seven bytes, you know, um, so it's eight bytes uh, from the start. And uh, to as you go from left to right, the, the end value is zero A and hexadecimal and decimal, it's the number 10 or the decimal 10. And so, and the other value in the next region, which is another eight byte uh, uh, span is, is the decimal two. And so then another part of the region of memory could be something else. So just, just saying how things can be laid out in, in various ways that you choose. And, and the two at the top are value layouts. So everything extends from memory layout. Um, so 
what is a memory layout? <laughs> um, so this is the uh, condensed definition from the Java doc. A memory layout can be used to describe the contents of a memory segment, which is that region in memory, um, and which we'll mention later. Uh, so, um, so some common value layout constants are predefined or defined in the value layout class, where in the first webinar, we talked about the of types, where you have of string, or I'm sorry, of char, of int, of float, of double. And then uh, there's um, instances that are predefined that are created like Java underscore int, Java underscore, um, and those value layouts are the ones that you typically use. So now that we know what a, a memory layout is and and it asks, it kind of says how it's described being regions in memory. And, you know, so what is a memory segment? A memory segment um, here, without reading this lengthy definition, um, I'll just read the first part of the paragraph. Um, a memory segment models a contiguous uh, region of memory. A memory segment is associated with both spatial and temporal bounds. Uh, so um, basically, um, whether it's spatial or temporal bounds, uh, meaning you know a region um, um, that's defined, uh, if you go out of that region, um, you, you can safely do it within Java within that try block because it knows where um, you're allowed to write. If you go out of those bounds, um, what's allocated, like say for instance, you have eight bytes and you go outside of that eight bytes and you're just, um, because when you access that memory address, there's an offset. And if you go out of the bounds, um, it will throw an exception because, um, because you're going through the API, the memory segment API, uh, Java has control of it when you're in the try block and it will can throw an index out of bounds, which is kind of nice because if you did it in the C world, you would get um, a crash. You, you would literally crash because you're out of the region where you're not allowed to be in, and um, which is really nice about um, this uh, memory segment APIs. Um, so another really important thing about memory segments, they have the methods to, in the C world, they call it dereferencing, which is another word for accessing a memory location's value, just pulling the data out. So back to memory layouts again, um, here's a UML class hierarchy showing the of types at the bottom there. Um, so it inherits from value layout, like I said before, from the first webinar uh, series that we needed to describe um, uh, C uh, or native uh, primitive types. So they're called value layouts. And then there's other layouts that we'll talk about later in this webinar that also um, its parent class or it extends from memory layout when we talk about structs and, and such. So again, um, I mentioned the predefined ones in Project Panama that um, are the Java underscore char and short and all the ones that represent uh, things in a portable way. Um, you would probably, you would likely use these, um, but if you use uh, J-Extract, it's more specific to the native language, uh, which is, like in the CABI, which is the C application binary interface, which allows you to uh, be more closer because some uh, platforms might be 32-bit versus 64-bit um, uh, byte width. So there's other defined ones that they are uh, within when you run J-Extract, but the ones I have there are just um, similar mappings to the ones on the left that they basically are pretty much synonymous if you're looking at, you know, Macintosh or 
or uh, Windows or the Linux 64-bit um, um, platforms. So here it is again. Um, when you run JExtract, it generates these uh, value layouts, these predefined value layouts that represent uh, the C, uh, the primitive types within the C language. So now that we know about value layouts, uh, now let's uh, create some primitives. It's really simple. Um, let me, uh, I'm going to show you two of them. One is simple: is uh, use the memory set uh, session. Um, instance from that try block, and there's a method called allocate. There's a lot of allocate methods, uh, overloaded ones, uh, that accept mem memory layouts. And so in this case, we're using um, the, va uh, the value layout java underscore double, which represents a, a C double or a Java double that holds it. And like we said in the first webinar, um, it understands the byte order of the platform. So if it's big Indian or little Indian, um, it it knows um, when they were defined for the platform, uh, for your JVM. So here you can just specify the value layout and then it'll create an instance or a uh, primitive uh, variable in memory off of the Java's memory heap and um, but there's another one that allows you to not only allocate that space but also set the value where it says math.py which is you know 3.14 or whatever and it sets it in that value and the the other method the second statement is allocate utf8 string which will take a java string in this case and it'll convert it into a c string which is a um, a pointer to a C char array. So in, in the C world, it's a null terminated string. Um, it's not the same as a, a Java uh, string. So you're creating a memory segment um, all the time. Every time you call the allocate methods, you create a memory segment um, object. So um, here is how you get the value out of the um, out of memory. Uh, you take the C double, which is, or I'm sorry, that object, and there's a get method on there, and you specify the value layout again, Java underscore double, and then you have to specify the offset. And so with the memory segment, you can actually move this pointer within that bounds. Um, when they talk about uh, spatial bounds, uh, a double is eight bytes. So, but since you're going from the start, it knows that it needs to grab eight bytes. So you start from the offset is at um, zero. So it's gonna return a eight byte value and then it converts it to a Java, um, you know, double, which is same in memory. And again, the second statement related to C strings here, um, you can get the offset that zero and it converts the C string, which is a pointer to a uh, C character array into a Java string. So here you pass in that zero it's the offset, it knows it's null terminated, it converts it to a Java string. And here we're using Java's printf to output the value. So it says a slice of pi. All right, so how do you set the value? It's really simple, it's the same kind of concept. You still have an offset value um, for your second parameter. And then the last um, argument is the value you want to set it as. So the first argument is, or the method is set. And the first argument is the value layout Java double, and then the uh, the offset, and then the value doubled. So it's two times pi, or doubled the value. And here, um, 
Again, to get the value, you pass in the zero offset. It comes in as a Java double, and then we're printing f um, using printf to, to output it. So two times pi is that uh, 6.28318. So again, here's another example of using J-Extract where you're using very you know, similar um, uh, value layouts that are predefined when you run J-Extract against a header file. And so here you see the C-doubles uh, as the value types that, um, that are generated um, and also these symbols or methods that are uh, generated for you that are convenient. You don't have to create the um, function descriptors to describe the sig uh, function signatures. Here, you just call this convenient method called printf or flush, uh, fflush, which is the native, it talks to the native um, um, li libraries, um, uh, the standard IOs functions natively. And uh, so there you have it for that. Okay, so now that we know how to deal with primitives, we're gonna just, now we're gonna create arrays. Again, we're, we're dealing with the memory segment. Um, we, we use the memory session to allocate things. So again, there's another method called allocate array. And you tell it what type or the value layout or memory layout that you want to um, create an array of. And in this case, you're creating an array of doubles. And of course, you could use Java ints. You could have, um, you know, array of ints, array of floats, array of doubles. And, and so here we created a thing in memory that's in the native world um, off of the Java's memory heap that um, is a, an array. So here we have a for loop. We're just outputting what's in the contents of that array. Um, so again, there's a, a, a getter method. It's called get at index. And so just to look a little bit closer, um, you have the memory segment object. Anytime you allocate something, you're always going to get a return type of this instance of a memory segment. So that that thing, that array in memory. Um, there's a method on the memory segment called um, get at index. You pass in the value layout and then you tell it the index, the position in the array. And there's the output of uh, the array. So again, very similar in the same way when you go set the values in the array, you you, you know, with the memory segment, there's a method called set at index, which then you pass in the value layout and then the index into the array. And then of course, the value that you want to set it at. And so this example, we have a for loop and this for loop, we're, we're just looping through, uh, you know, from zero to six or zero to 15, I guess I less than 16. We're setting uh, of type, you know, double the index from zero to 15, and we're just doubling the value. So we're getting the value out from that position in the array, and then we're doubling it and we're setting it back into the array in that same position. So with an output loop, um, getting it, the, and you see the array, it's outputted and then each value is doubled. So now, now that we know like value layouts or you know simple primitives in the C world, we're now going to talk about um, structs. So this is the concept of um, it's kind of like classes in um, Java and C++, where um, where uh, you can describe more complex things with uh, primitives and such. So here's an example of a simple example of a point, and we're using integers, uh, not, not floating point. But um, so you declare it, at, you know, it's called a struct. 
and then the name of the struct is point and the attributes are a C integer with an X value, an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. So in, in native code to declare or instantiate a um, point uh, variable that represents that, uh, it creates it in memory. And uh, so you say struct, the type or a point, and then the variable name PT. And here you're setting the values in memory and then the um, printf goes out and outputs it, um, substitutes it in that. Um, so the output is C point equals, you know, the values you, you see there, the X and Y coordinates. So how do you do it in Project Panama? So what you, again, um, off of the memory layout class, you're going to have um, additional methods that can build the equivalent in the native world. So here you have a struct layout, which um, models a struct. And here um, you, you um, the attribute is a Java underscore int with that value layout, and then you name it with the with name method. So you have the X and you have the Y. So that's just a representation of the struct. So it's not actually the instance, it's just um, showing how it's laid out in memory. So of course, you'll see later in the memory session, there's an allocate method. You pass that in and you're gonna get a memory session or a memory segment instance. So here is again, a struct in the Project Panama, it's called a group layout. Um, and that also extends from memory layout. So how do you interrogate a memory segment uh, based on a uh, memory layout? Um, these are um, what is called var handles. It's how to uh, uh, dereference uh, variables or access um, uh, things in memory. So for instance, uh, you can have a struct, uh, you can have a struct within a struct. So you have to have var handles in order to traverse that object. If it's a nested object, it's not necessarily called objects, but it's, it's a struct instance, a C struct instance that can allow you to interrogate the object, the nested object, um, or the nested struct. So off of the memory layout, um, um, yeah, off of the memory layout uh, instance, uh, whether it's a group layout or, um, uh, yeah, the group layout, it has a var handle method. And that var handle method has um, variable arguments of, um, you know, zero to many, uh, path elements, and these path elements are the way to interrogate the struct if it's a complex struct, such as a, a nested struct. Uh, so you can um, traverse through it. Or, and what we're going to talk about later is um, uh, an array of structs, which allows you to walk through the array and then walk through the um, the struct. So it returns a var handle. So what we have to do is create a var handle, and then we pass in these path elements to describe the, the path to interrogate or um, how to dereference that object. So um, again, I showed you how, or earlier slide, how to create a group layout, which represents the um, memory layout of a struct. Then you pass it to the memory sessions allocate method, which creates an instance in memory space for that um, struct, which is a, a point uh, struct in memory, which is uh, the memory segment instance. So now we want to create uh, var handles so that we know how to interrogate this uh, point. So here again, you, you just uh, pass in 
memory layout dot path element dot group element in the attribute and this only tells you how to walk the uh, struct or the object and so <clears throat> so in order to get the actual value in that struct you take the var handle you know in this case var a uh, the var handle the x coordinate um, you just call the get method and you pass in the object or that that instance of that struct and then it'll and you have to cast it of course uh, because it returns an object and then here you return the x value in the java world and so here's how you set it it's pretty much identical it's like a getter and a setter um, you know you still pass in the memory segment as the first argument and then the value that you want to set it as so it'll set x and y so here's another complex example just to give you um a you know it's a little bit more flexible because like a lot of the examples that you see online are just using ints but here uh c character arrays are basically like C string or their C strings and in the Java world they're dynamic so they can be variable length and so a lot of the examples they'll have it fixed length like 50 characters but in this case um, with a pointer to a character you can allocate it using um, the methods I showed you in the previous slides about the UTF um, get UTF-8 um, it can actually dynamically create it through Panama, so you can actually have a variable length uh, character uh, C uh, string. So again, using a group layout, using the struct layout, will describe the layout that you're looking for. You have value layouts, uh, Java underscore long, and if it's a pointer, it's using the address value layout. And with name, you specify the attributes name in there. So again, um, you create it, you use uh, memory session dot allocate, you pass in that group layout, boom, you get that thing in memory. Um, it's in the native world. And so you have to create um, var handles to interrogate it. And in this case, um, again, you specify um, um, memory layout dot path element dot group layout. Or a group element, and here uh, that that so before I just showed you what we've done before with the um, Java underscore int or an int, but this one is or the one above was a I believe it was a long, and so the second one is um, this the C string, but here you're um, you're taking a Java string and you're converting it to a memory segment using the allocate UTF-8 string and then you're getting the address you have to call that method called address because like we did before the value layout was that uh, predefined uh, value layout was it was called address you know all caps so again to get the values out of um, using the var handles, you have to cast it. So here you're returning the long that was inside of that um, that uh, memory segment, and um, the name you can get it, um, but you have to cast it to a memory address. So it's really an address in memory, and and uh, that's it's where it's pointing to. And and again, uh, that convenience method. Um, off of the memory segment or the memory address, uh, the C name temp, you call the get UTF-8 string with zero offset and it will return that string and you don't have to know how long it is and, and the length of it. So that so you've taken what was in native world in a C string and you've returned it you know, from a struct into the Java world and then you're outputting it um, and you see it there. So how do you create an array of structs? So 
and try to move along a little faster. I think we're almost out of time. So anyhow, uh, we talked about value layouts. They extend from memory layout and uh, group layouts uh, describe structs and how to create structs. And um, basically an array of structs is called a sequence layout. And sequence layout, of course, it extends from memory layout. And in the native world, here's how you uh, define a struct and then you can actually create um, an array of structs. And here you're putting five, you're, you're wanting five instances and it's empty memory, um, but then you would have to populate it. And how, and the way to populate it, you would need, again, the group layouts, um, uh, um, uh, you have to create the var handles for that. So the sequence layout method off of the memory layout, again, these convenience methods will return you that group layout that you've passed in and you want five of them. So it will create um, a sequence layout, which is still a representation of what it looks like in memory. It isn't an instance in memory. It isn't uh, ha hasn't been allocated yet. So you're just representing what it looks like. Um, it's an array of structs. So you're passing in five and uh, the group layout, which is the struct. And so here again, you call the memory session dot allocate, you pass in the sequence struct and you return always a memory segment instance. So the, the name of the variable is called points. It's an array of structs. And then um, you have to create var handles to interrogate the object again. And in this case, when you pass in path elements, the first argument or the first path element is going to be what is called a sequence element. It's saying that you have to walk in through the position within the array, and then the group element X, which is the attribute of that struct. Uh, so that's how you uh, walk through memory to uh, dereference the value that's in that array. This is just the, the, the way to get the value, not um, um, actually getting the value. You have to pass in the memory segment again. So here's how you set the value. Here I created a looping, uh, a loop where I create random values from one or zero to a hundred. And I'm just, um, so the second argument is the index um, into the array and points of course is that um, empty array structure that contains uh, I believe five um, ints or five structs. And here you're just passing in the uh, random values. And here I'm just outputting them. Again, of our handle has a get method. And then the second argument, the I, you see is the index into the array. So there's the output. And that's pretty straightforward. So here we come with the demos. Um, we're, we're really close now. So, um, I have this demo where I created a JavaFX application. If no one's not, um, if you want to see the uh, demos, um, they're at the github.com slash Carl D slash Panama webinar. And in it, you have to download um, a few things, which I'll explain in a minute. But I just want to show you that this is just a plain uh, Java application that uses JavaFX. There's a web view component that goes onto the scene graph and um, it's displaying uh, HTML5, which is, uh, a, uh, it has um, SVG or a scalable vector clock that I made. So the clock face uh, is kind of static. And then um, those arms, uh, the hour hand, this, the minute hand and the uh, second hand are just uh, lines and they're static again. Uh, they're elements within the um, 
description of the uh, vector uh, graphic. Um, the G means group, but um, uh, here you have it colorized and you, I have a uh, stroke, you know, just making it um, a little colorful. And um, in that uh, web view component, it can render HTML um, a code and also JavaScript functions. And here I, uh, I created a function that you pass in the angle for the second hand, the minute hand, and the hour hand. And basically it takes those lines in the SVG elements and it rotates them using um, JavaScript to interact with the uh, SVG um, objects. So it, you just pass in those values, it rotates the arms. And by rotating the arms, here's the function called um, update time. So this is purely JavaScript in a web page that's rendered in the web view component within JavaFX. So this, for every second uh, that, that goes by, it calls this function, this JavaScript function from Java passing in the hour, minutes, and seconds. And so with the math, it knows the angle for like, for instance, from three o'clock to 12 o'clock, it's a 90 degree angle, uh, depending on which way you start. So it, it moves or rotates that um, arm. So this is a really simple um, JavaFX application. You have a start method, which uh, starts the JavaFX thread, and it starts assembling the scene graph. And here, um, here's the update clock uh, function where it uses the zone date time. Uh, it's pure Java, and the next uh, I'm going to show you later um, is the uh, Panama version, but so here in this uh, start method, I created a simple animation timer. So every tick of a second, I want you, I want to invoke that update uh, clock runnable. Uh, so every second, call that update, pass in um, uh, the right information. So in this version of the demo, uh, this particular um, JavaFX application is taking the zone date time, which is um, you can call the now function and it gives you all the um, time date stamp information of right now. And then there's methods that conveniently give you the um, hour, the minute, and the seconds. And then here um, in the web view component within JavaFX, there's a web engine and in, on that method, there's an execute script, which allows you to call into the HTML where the JavaScript function is, and it's going to call update time or update time function or JavaScript function with those. Um, uh, it's a 12 hour uh, time. I calculate it, was, it when they give you the hour, it's zero to 23. And I calculate it to just be, um, you know, zero to 12, or I think, yeah. So that's how you down, make a down call into JavaScript from Java. So here's the same application. Uh, you know, now we're using Panama. So here, like you've seen before, a uh, C struct, and it's very similar to the point struct it's all integers uh, values. And here it's represented in the same way as the uh, date time, date or the zoned date time class, where you have the seconds, you have the minutes, you have the hours and you have the day of the month and, and such. So, um, so this is how you'd call it in a native way. Um, there's this concept of a type def, which represents, uh, it's an alias to an actual type uh, for that date time, date, I mean, time underscore T, which is actually, I believe it's a long um, 
similar to uh, it's either long or a 32-bit value. I can't remember. Um, but the idea is that you're getting the seconds since epoch, or you get the time today. Uh, like epoch time is 1970, January 1st at zero o'clock or whatever. And so with that um, value, it's basically the number of seconds. And then um, here's a declaration of a struct called TM, which creates a, it's a, it's a area where it's going to populate it. It's not populated yet. So you call the time function to actually populate that long or that time underscore T value, that raw time. And it populates that with that um, second since epoch. Then you pass that in, that value into the local time function. And that'll give you the populated struct representing those int values in that struct. And then the printf uh, outputs, um, you know, the, so there's a convenience function that will just output the date time and the time stamp. So how do you do it in Project Panama? It's pretty simple. Uh, where we use the zone date time, we're going to replace it with Project Panama code. And here you have the try uh, resource block where you create a memory session, you use the allocate, and here I use JExtract to conveniently create a lot of these symbols and um, types. Um, and all you have to do is pass it because there are their value layouts also. So when you pass it into the memory session dot allocate, the time the time underscore t type will create an instance in memory um, as a memory segment. So you can then use it, um, which is the long of the epoch time. Then you, um, then you want to create a struct instance so that you can actually, it's an empty instance, so you can populate it. Then when you call the time method, which will, um, I'm sorry, that'll populate the long. So after you populate the long with the current time, you pass that in to the local time underscore R, which JXtrax um, creates it. So you don't have to create this with uh, the function descriptors and doing anything manual. So then when you call that or invoke that method, um, it simply populates that struct. And then that struct also J extract will create method or um, var handles for you that will allow you to walk that struct and pull those values out. So um, this the native struct, you're pulling the values out where that struct was populated within hours, minutes, and seconds. Now you're in the Java world and you're now passing it back into the Java FX component the web engine, so the JavaScript, and you're talking to the update time function in JavaScript so that it can calculate the arms and such. So um, it's totally unaware that it was written using native code to talk to uh, the actual clock. So we're coming to the end, um, just showing you how to run the demo examples. If you um, you need JExtract to actually generate the binding code, which I mentioned uh, before, I don't show you how to use uh, the tool, but th there's instructions here. You can go to uh, an article I wrote there above it, from fuj.io, which is um, how to build uh, Project Panama's uh, JExtract tool by yourself. Um, and the actual uh, JExtract tool uh, project is at github.com slash openjdk slash uh, jextract. So I created also scripts within uh, the different operating systems. It's over at the GitHub, um, uh, you know, my project. And there um, you can just, after you've, um, you know, have jextract running, uh, you can run these and it would generate that binding code for the examples. It would um, put them in the class path.
And so with JavaFX, for those that don't know what JavaFX is, it's a uh, windowing toolkit. It's like the um, next generation from Swing. Uh, so those that are familiar with uh, Java Swing, uh, it's thick client development where you can create desktop apps. Uh, and so um, here I obtained libraries from Gluon HQ. Uh, you can also get um, JavaFX from our JDK builds, but uh, from Azul, but uh, because JDK 19 um, is only in preview release, um, we don't have it included um, yet until it's released in uh, general availability. So those, uh, we generally set a pa an environment variable called path to FX, and we'll use that later to run it uh, because we need it uh, to add the modules. So real quick, um, this is how you compile it. The first uh, switch is the path to FX, which is where the libraries are located that I showed you earlier. Um, so the add modules, these are the modules used in the JavaFX application. And dash D is where you're going to output the compiled uh, class file, which is Panama native time fx.java. That's going to go in there. But also in the prior step where you had JExtract, it actually generated the binding codes in that class's directory. So when you, in the next, in the last step, which is running it, you're going to need that class classes directory uh, to run. So there, dash class path. And of course, I forgot to mention enable preview uh, and dash source 19. You have to do that when you're compiling uh, source code because you're, you're enabling the preview features and you're telling it that you want it to be uh, source JDK 19 uh, compatible. So this is how you run it in the same way that you compiled it, but you don't have to run the, you don't have to put the source um, 19. Again, you put the class path because it has the uh, Panama bindings and it has the, um, the compiled Panama native time. And so you're just running it at this point. So, okay, everybody, this is, um, I'm wrapping up part two of the three-part series. And so before I hand it over to Jenny, I'm um, just wondering if anybody has any questions. Kind of ran over. No worries. Yeah, I think we've got a few minutes left. Um, so I'll go and see if we have any questions in the Q&A chat here. Um, um, well, feel free if you have any questions to type that into the questions chat box, but I do have a question here, Carl, for you. Um, when generating Panama binding code Java classes using J extract, do you need to generate classes for each operating system, assuming you are targeting a native library on Mac, Linux, or Windows? Yep. Um, so the, yeah, the quick answer is yes. Um, usually, um, when you have generated code for the platform, when you use JExtract, it's very specific to that operating system. So they're going to include like certain value layouts for different uh, memory layout types um, and some symbols that don't exist on another platform. So when JExtract generates this code, it's really specific for that environment or that platform, such as Windows, Linux, or Mac. And so when you generate the code, you don't want to check in that source code, which I did in the um, in the GitHub account, which I will remove. So you'll have to get JExtract, set it up, and then you would target those header files and generate uh, the classes. And if you're a library owner and you're generating Panama code to talk to native libraries, um, you would create a jar file specific for that operating system using JExtract uh, for Windows, um, for Linux, and they're all separate. So you don't want to check in the source code, but you're literally generating classes uh, specific, uh, you know, from JExtract for those uh, 
um, popular OSs. Perfect. Thanks, Carl. And then I have one more question here. Um, in the demo, when using Panama to access the time C struct, it used a C pointer to the C struct. How do you create a pointer? Okay. So it, C pointers is a C um, concept. When you uh, use the memory session dot allocate and you take a memory layout or a value layout that instantiates a thing in memory, you always return a memory segment, right? And that memory segment is just a representation and then there's a method on there called address. And that address is literally the address of the location of the value, where the value, it, or where it's going to hold the value. So that address is the location. That is actually the concept of a C pointer. It's just an address. It's just an address location. So, yep. Good Thanks, question. Carl. Yeah. Um, and it looks like I don't see any other questions. So um, we'll go ahead and wrap up the presentation. Um, thank you, Carl, for a great presentation. And then thank you, everyone, for joining today. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, please make sure you fill out our survey so that we can continue to improve our webinar program. And then we'll also be sending a link to register for the third session in an email um, after this webinar concludes as well. So thank you so much for joining us today. And everyone have a great day. Thank you. Bye.